I want to do something a little different today. Obviously, today we're looking at First and Second Chronicles, the sacred history retold, and I will talk about why this book has all the, the genealogies and all that sort of stuff. Uh, but in next week, of course, we will deal with Ezra and Nehemiah, the stories of the return, that is, the first Jews who were allowed to return to Jerusalem uh, by Cyrus the Great of Persia. And then the last week, we'll spend the first hour talking about the book of Esther, a wonderful story. And the second half, we will deal with the final exam. Again, if you did not pick up a copy of the What You Need to Know from the Old Testament history books, then you can get a copy of that at the break. Um, if you have any questions next week, if you have a week. If you have any questions in studying that, you can ask me next week so that you'll be all ready for the exam. And again, I encourage everyone, even though Joanne's already told me she's punking out on us, I uh, encourage everybody to take the test. There's no downside. Uh, you have to take the test if you're taking this for a certificate or a degree, but I encourage you to study the material and take the test because you will learn more, very simply. If you prepare yourself and you're thinking in terms of learning it so that you will know it to, for a test, then you will end up knowing it better overall. So, and, and again, there's no downside. It's not like it goes on, as I said before, it's not like it goes on your permanent record. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't know where my permanent record is. I doubt you know where yours is, right? Remember how they used to threaten us with that all the time? Cool. <laughs> this is going to go on your permanent record. Uh, it's got to be somewhere. It's permanent. Okay. Um, this, of course, is the structure we've been talking about. We are dealing with these, the history books. We're now in First and Second Chronicles. Next week, we deal with Ezra and Nehemiah and then Esther. Next term, now the next term will start in April. It will be April and May. There actually will be one week in the middle that we take a break. You know, you're going to get a, a, a midterm vacation because Carol and I have one of our closest friends is having her 60th birthday, and she's celebrating it by taking a five-day cruise between San Diego and Vancouver, British Columbia. And so we promised her a long time ago that we would join her for that. So we will be out for that. But um, it will, we'll still get it done in April, May. So the next term will be April, May, and we will look at the wisdom books, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and the Song of Solomon or Song of Songs. All right? I want to do something a little bit different today. I want to, I touched on this last week, but I want to spend some time talking about the conquest of the northern kingdom of Israel by Assyria and then the conquest of the southern kingdom of Babylon by, uh, or a southern kingdom of Judah by Babylon, or the Babylonians. And the reason for that is not only, we hit on that last week when we were talking about um, Second Kings, these events happened uh, during the time written about in Second Kings, but the effect on the Israelites, the effect on the Jewish people was so significant that we need to have an understanding of what happened there and what it all meant in order for us to have a real understanding of what Chronicles is all about. Because Chronicles, the book of Chronicles, are written post-exile, which means after the Jewish people were exiled into Babylonia and then were released to come back home. Um, and, and it deals with the, the concerns, the problems, the frustrations, the fears that the Israelites had. And you have to understand a little bit more about that in order to really understand what's happening in the book of Chronicles. For instance, why are all these genealogies in the first nine chapters? So I want us to talk about that a little bit and uh, give you an understanding. Now, this map, um, both Assyria and Babylon had two major ascendancies, meaning there was an early Assyrian Empire and a later Assyrian Empire. And same thing with Babylon. It was an early Babylonian Empire and a later Babylonian Empire. And we're going to talk about both of those. The one that affects our story here, uh, the Jewish people, in both cases, is the second Assyrian and second Babylonian, or what's called the Neo-Assyrian Empire, new, Neo-New, and the Neo-Babylonian or New Babylonian Empire. Now, the, light, the darker green section here is the first Assyrian Empire, which was in the 9th century BC, the 800s BC, before Christ. Uh, and it was a very powerful empire. It controlled, this is Babylon right here, so it controlled, the, the, this is Mesopotamia, the land between the rivers, the very, hello, we're filming, <laughs> and you're in it. Um, the Mesopotamian, or land between the rivers, which was the, the, the location of the earliest human civilizations, as far as we know. There may have been an Indus River uh, civilization in Pakistan and India that was as early, but this is the, 
the, and the Assyrian Empire started there, controlled that, the Babylonian Empire as well. Actually, the early Babylonian Empire was before Assyria ascended. And then we have the two Assyrian empires. And, and then we have the, uh, the Neo-Babylonian Empire coming along. So this was the first Assyrian Empire in the 9th century BC. They fell out of uh, power. They, they, they had a, a decline of power. The Egyptians grew in power. Various other things were happening. And then, uh, about 150 years later, the Neo-Assyrian Empire in the 7th century arises and takes over again. And it covered quite a bit more territory. All of this light green is the Neo-Assyrian Empire. You'll notice they took over all of Egypt, um, all the way over into what would be like Susa, because it was the capital of the Persian Empire. So they took over part of what we later became Persia. They took over part of Asia Minor, which was the kingdom of the Hittites, all the way up, you know, almost to the Black Sea up here. So it was one of the largest and most significant empires ever. The interesting thing is, and it's hard to see from back there, but do you know, you see this little thing right around Judah? That it's yeah. yellow. Yeah. It's not green. Mm -hmm. Because while the Assyrians conquered and completely destroyed the northern kingdom of Israel, the southern kingdom of Judah was the only part of the whole uh, Fertile Crescent and Levant and the whole area of the Eastern Mediterranean that the Assyrians did not conquer. What happened was, in 722, they conquered the northern kingdom of Israel and the capital in Samaria and carried the people off into exile. But then, uh, the general of Sennacherib, the head of the Assyrians at that point, comes down to Jerusalem, the capital of the southern kingdom of Judah. And they camp out outside the gates, and Hezekiah is the king. He was a good king. He really tried to follow the Lord. He instituted reforms. I, uh, Isaiah was the prophet at that point. Isaiah the prophet told Hezekiah, it doesn't matter what they're saying. It doesn't matter how many countries the, the Assyrians have conquered, as you can see. God will not let them take Jerusalem. And so Hezekiah said no, but he didn't say so with a very strong voice. <laughs> and the next day, 185,000 Assyrians were dead. Now, history says, you know, secular history says it was a plague. But we do know that, uh, that there's independent, that is extra biblical, outside the Bible confirmation of this, because the Assyrian records of that time, which always, always boasted, uh, you know, they would say the most boastful things they could, it talks about how many fortified cities that Sennacherib destroyed, how many countries he conquered, and then it says, and he penned King Hezekiah up in his city like a bird in a cage. In other words, it admits that he did not defeat King Hezekiah. He did not capture Jerusalem. The most boastful thing you can say about it is we pinned him up in the city so he couldn't escape. And then Sennacherib, after all these soldiers were dead, he goes back to his, to his capital and ends up, uh, not too long later, his two sons sneak up on him when he's in the temple worshiping and kill him and take over. So, but that's why you've got a little, in the maps, you've got a little place here in yellow. It's the only part of this whole region that Assyria did not control. Eric. Um, I just have a small question. The, I can't tell if it's dark green or light green, but the little river thing at the top, the little swiggle, what is that? Oh, right is that there, the kingdom of Europe. Yeah, that little half. This oh, that a river this was or? an area that was not considered part of the Assyrian Empire, but they had control over. For okay. instance, the same thing was true at, during Solomon's day. It would have meant that while they may not have, you know, have just taken over, put their armies in there, controlled everything, that they were considering that a vassal state, which means they had to pay tribute to to the Assyrians. They had to. They were under the control, but they weren't actually part of the kingdom. So that's what this green line is right here. That the kingdom of Urartu was subject to, even though they retained some independence. Okay? Yes, Marvin? I, I don't quite understand, though, in, in Judah, didn't he conquer most of the other cities? He did. And, and, and couldn't he have carried the people away? And Well, apparently, when, you know, when, according to the king, way the King James says, when they woke up the next morning to find themselves dead, 185,000 of them, he <laughs> retreated back to his capital. Oh, yes. Yeah, so, and so he, he did not... You know, it's like, ah, 
let's go, you know, and they loaded up and went. Which means the area that still is south of Jerusalem, that the city of Jerusalem and King Hezekiah would have had some control over, they didn't take the next step, and that is to completely conquer this Nabalche. Yes? Where was the capital at that time? Jerusalem. This is, I mean, of the Assyrians. Uh, the capital of the Assyrians uh, was in, well, it started out Asher, and then it went to Nineveh. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Asher is actually where they get the name Assyrians. That's a know, long trip. Asher. Oh, very long trip. <coughs> and in fact, to give you some idea, the, the Assyrians are probably um, the most warlike, most militaristic people that, have, that we have any knowledge of in history. Nobody was as, uh, as aggressive, as, as much oriented toward conquering, and as cruel to the people they conquered as the Assyrians. These are, these are some of the um, reliefs that have been found in Nineveh and some of the other ruins. Uh, the one in the upper left, the, this is a relief of them carrying off on carts all sorts of goods and things. This is a soldier, an Assyrian soldier with a spear, taking slaves away. And this is a picture of Assyrian soldiers flaying victims alive. They're tied down and they're skinning them alive. This is an image of this guy is stacking up decapitated heads. The Assyrians believed that the way to conquer, and the way then to make sure that people stayed conquered, was, was to as, be as cruel, as vicious as possible. They frequently, if like in the case of Jerusalem, they didn't do this in Jerusalem, but in other places, if there was a fortified city that opposed them, they would collect up all the other people from the surrounding countryside they could, and um, kill them and pile their bodies up in front of the gate uh -huh. as a symbol of what's going to happen to the people inside if they don't give up. Uh -huh. All right. Uh, this is a picture of a commander, maybe even the the, uh, the king himself, on a chariot. And chariots were the tanks of their day. You know, not not all the kingdoms had. In fact, it wasn't until Solomon's day that the uh, <coughs> the Israelites ever used the chariots. He imported horses and chariots. King David fought against people with chariots, but he, and because it says he uh, would hamstring the chariot horses and things like that, but they were not used. The Hittites invented the chariot, and then the Assyrians, because the Assyrians and the Hittites, the Hittites and the Egyptians uh, fought in battle of the bat in fact, the Battle of Carchemish between the Hittite Empire and the Egyptian Empire was the largest chariot battle ever. So this is a commander, or maybe even the king, and this is slaves being taken off from a fortified city. Up here, we have one of the Hebrew kings bowing down um, in, in uh, honor of the Assyrian king. Okay, Pam, you had a question? What does hamstring horses mean? You know your hamstring muscles? Yeah. You cut them so they can't walk anymore or run anymore. It's not a positive thing, but you know, that's, that's how they, these were war horses. These were not the sort of things like, oh, well, let's take these home. Our daughters would like them. Yes. War horses were taught to kick and to bite to rear up, to, you know, they were, they were taught to be violent. If, you know, and David didn't have chariots, and so he had no use of chariot horses, and so he, I'm sure that they basically destroyed them after that, but it says that they were hamstrung, meaning they were incapacitated. Yes, Rich? Who first initiated death by crucifixion? Uh, I don't know who did it before the Romans, Mike. Phoenicians did. The Phoenicians? Okay. Phoenicians? And they borrowed it, I believe, from the Babylonians. Okay, well, there were, there were all sorts of versions of it. In fact, when you, when you get to the book of Esther, um, Haman, depending on which version you use, they will talk about the fact that Haman built a gallows on which to hang Mordecai, and they hanged him himself. Well, some versions read that it was, uh, he was impaled. One of the things they used to do, and Vlad the Impaler, the, the character from, uh, from Romanian history that uh, is, was the origin of the legend of Dracula, because his name literally was Vlad Dracul, Vlad the, the dragon, um, he would, um, his favorite thing was to take sharpened stakes and impale people on them, which literally mean hold them down and run the stake through them from their bottom up, and then set the stakes up. And he, in Vlad the Impaler, when he was being attacked by Hungarian forces, he actually did that to thousands and thousands of his own people. And, st and stuck the poles up along the roadway, thinking that once if they see how how scary I am, they'll turn and run away. Well, they didn't. Okay. But when you read the NIV, for instance, it translates it that Haman was impaled outside his his own place. Um, and so 
The idea of crucifixion may have been a development, the idea that, you know, if you didn't actually impale them, if you tied them to a pole, a stake, you saw what suffering they had, it may have been that they developed the whole crucifixion thing from that, because it's a fairly simple thing to mount a pole and tie somebody to until they die, okay? So, I'm sorry, that was all kind of gross, but this, <laughs> this is part of the history. And this is, you know, you do get flaying alive, you know, piling up severed heads, all of that kind of stuff. This is what the Assyrians were like. They were a rough bunch. Another thing that they did was when they conquered a people, they would uh, deport them in mass. Now, they did that for several reasons. One is when you took the people away from their homes and took them to other countries, you diminished the likelihood that they would get organized to try to rebel against you. And if you then replaced them with conquered people from somewhere else that you, de you deported to there, then the whole thing gets watered down. This is a, uh, the people, They're both the people's bloodlines, their sense of nationality, their likelihood of rebelling, all of that is diminished. And the Assyrians perfected that. Who they didn't kill, they carried off into captivity. This, um, the, the purple line here, is a diagram of the deportation by Tiglath-Pileser III. Okay, the first of the great Assyrian conquerors. Then you've got a red line here, which is a, de a second deportation that was done by Shalmaneser V and, and Sargon. And then you've got another one where the people that had already been deported this far, he took them all the way east into the area of Medea, the Persian region. This is when Persia had not yet ascended. So the idea was that large numbers of Israelites from the northern kingdom of Israel were deported, spread out, and other peoples that were not Jewish were brought into the areas in order to have workers to work the vineyards and the fields and all of that. This is, this is where the story of the ten lost tribes of Israel come from. The northern kingdom of Israel, you know, there's the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. The southern kingdom of Judah was made up of only two tribes. The largest tribe, Judah, which is why they called it the kingdom of Judah, and the tribe of Benjamin, which was the smallest of all the tribes, because it had gotten decimated. You remember back when they, you know, when they really messed up and the other Israelites rose up against them and, and killed most of them, and then struggled to say, well, now they don't even have any wives. We don't want the whole whole tribe to, you know, to die out. So they stole women to give to them so they would have children. <laughs> Again, part of the truth, the way the reason we read this book and say it's true is because it tells us things like that about God's own people. Why would it do that if it wasn't true? There is no motivation to tell those stories unless that's really what happened. Well, the southern kingdom of Judah was made up of the largest tribe, Judah, and the smallest tribe, Benjamin. The other ten tribes that had entered the, the promised land um, are in the north. Since Assyria conquered the northern kingdom of Israel, which was the ten tribes in the north, and carried them off into uh, they deported them into all over the Assyrian kingdom. They became the ten lost tribes of Israel. You have heard of the lost tribes of Israel, right? That's because those ten tribes were, were spread out so thin and intermarried with other people and everything else, they never returned or regained their, their identity as Jews. And so they became the lost tribes. Now, there were still some Jews that were left in the north. They didn't take every single living person. Um, and some of them later would trickle back in, but they invariably intermarried with other people, so they were not pure Jews. They also had a kind of worship that was not true Judaism. They added an 11th commandment, for instance, which said it was okay for them to worship on the mountain that's right outside the capital city of Samaria. Um, and so their, their scripture, their Old Testament uh, scripture, was uh, polluted. And the Jews thought that the people were polluted because they weren't 100% Jewish anymore. They had other strands of blood in them. Those are the people, because Samaria was the, north, the capital of the northern kingdom of Israel, they became known as Samaritans. And the Samaritans were half-blooded Jews. The Jews thought they were pure blood, their religion was polluted, everything was messed up about them. And so that's why the Jews didn't like the Samaritans, and therefore the Samaritans didn't like the Jews. When they started to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem, uh, the Samaritans, some of them volunteered to help, and the Jews said, no, we don't want you to help. And there were always hard feelings after that. Okay, So that's where the Samaritans, and the story of the Good Samaritan, a Levite and a priest walk by on the other side of a man that's injured, but a Samaritan stops and helps him. Samaritan, somebody know what, that the Jews would have hated. 
the Samaritan woman at the well, when Jesus talks to her, the fact that she's not only is he talking to a woman, which was unheard of, but a Samaritan besides. Marvin? I think it's significant that the first three years of Rehoboam's reign, because uh, Jeroboam had appointed his own priest and his own priesthood, but right. many of the Levites went to Judah, and also people from some of the other tribes. Yes. A few of them left the north. So there are actually some of them. Right. There were not any hard lines. No. I mean, it's not like they built walls in between the various you know, uh, lands that the tribes had. For instance, if you look at a map, including some of the maps I gave you, that have colored swatches for the different peoples, well, the tribe of Dan didn't like where they were because the Phoenicians were there, and they kept having to fight the Phoenicians, and so they moved all the way up to the far north. They'd been down not too far from Jerusalem to the far north, took over a town, killed everybody in it, and renamed it Dan. And so that's why you find Dan on the map, even though the tribe of Dan, originally their property was down south. The um, Ephraim, a large part of the tribe of Ephraim, had been down inside the, with the tribe of Judah control. They too had moved north. But as Marvin was saying, some of the other peoples came south, and the Levites, who the whole tribe of Levi was supposed to serve in the temple. Well, the temple was in the southern kingdom of Judah. And instead of trying to figure out how they were going to work that out, the first thing that Jeroboam did uh, in the north is he decides, I'm not going to negotiate to go to the temple. We don't have access to the temple anymore easily. I'll create my own places of worship. And he had two golden calves built or made. One of them he put in Dan up north and one down south. So the people in various parts of the northern kingdom would get to them. But you did have people who have protested that from, from the northern tribes moved south into Judah, and especially some of the Levites, since their whole focus was to minister in the temple. And Jeroboam says, we're not going to have the temple anymore. Some of the Levites went back south. So there was no hard and fast rule, but we are talking about the predominance of the populations of the ten tribes of the north got spread out and technically lost. Yes? I got a question. Um, do you, is help put it in, in place, do you remember the story where um, uh, they, they took all the people out of the north, they dispersed them, and they replaced them with people. I think they were the Assyrians, and lions came out, and they started killing everybody. And so word got back to the king, and the king said, well, send a prophet that we got from there to go back, because they need to know that, that you know, he can, he can cure this. So he comes down, and he tries to preach to them about Yahweh. Somehow the lions stopped. Was that during? You know, I am not remembering that story. I'm just wondering. I'm just not remembering it. It is a. It is the, the 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 empire comes in, takes everybody out, and I'm assuming that's my question. Sounds like the Assyrians. The Assyrians. The Babylonians deported people too, but not the same way. And they replaced them. It was in the north. It was in the north. And they replaced them with people from their own country. Mm -hmm. And then lions start to come out and kill people, and the king finds out about it. I wonder where the lions are. Yeah. I don't know. We'll have to check on that. Yeah. See if you can find it. Yeah, see if you can find it. We'll talk about it later. But we're looking for it. Not necessarily right now, unless we'll look for it. So the northern tribe got pretty much uh, destroyed. They were either deported or assimilated in such a way that they no longer had a national a sense of national personality. Okay? Um, then. The Babylonian Empire, and the Babylonian Empire also had two important periods. Um, and the Babylonian Empire became more important to the Israelites in terms of their future, and we'll talk about that. The first Babylonian Empire was all the way back into the 1750 BC period. Um, this is before the Egyptian, before the Israelites left Egypt, you know, before the Promised Land entry, before the time of the desert, or the giving of the law, or any of that. In fact, this goes back to the prehistoric time. This is a bust of Hammurabi, a name you probably heard from your world history classes. Hammurabi was the one who lifted the, the original Babylonians. He overcame some of the people that had controlled them, and he created independence. Uh, Hammurabi created the first written law that we know anything about, the Code of Hammurabi. And much of what we see in the Code of Hammurabi ended up passing down, and they were, they were values that are incorporated into the Mosaic Law and into the laws since then. You know, penalties for stealing and things like that that nobody had ever written down before. To a great extent, in ancient, ancient times, if you could get away with it, it wasn't illegal. <laughs> and so if you were stronger, then you could do whatever you wanted. Hammurabi is the first example we have of somebody who formalized a set of laws 
that said, you, just because you have the, you, you're stronger, just because you have the power, doesn't mean you can do something and it's okay. Uh, so this was Hammurabi, and the Tower of Babel, Babel, Babylon, same root. It's believed that the Tower of Babel probably was one of the early constructions in Babylon. And so this is prehistory time. This is before Abraham. This is part of the first 11 chapters of Genesis. So we're talking about that time period, 1,800 years before Jesus. <laughs> and so the, that was the first ascendancy of the power of Babylon under Hammurabi. Then they did decline. And in fact, during their decline, you have the Hittites coming into power in the Asia Minor, what we know of as Turkey. You have the Egyptians all during this time. You have the Assyrians arising, declining in front of the Egyptian power, and they're rising again. And then you have the second Babylonian Empire, which came along over a thousand years later. This is what it looked like in 586 BC, which is when they destroyed the, the city of Jerusalem. Now, you'll notice this is exactly the area that the you know, much of the same area that the Assyrians had control because the Babylonians conquered the Assyrians. Asher and Nineveh had been capitals of Assyria. Asher is where they get the name Assyria. And Nineveh had been the capital, and you remember the story of Jonah. Jonah, the reluctant prophet, who God called to go to the city of Nineveh and preach, he was going to preach to the Assyrians, and he didn't like it. So he ran away, and when he finally got, got his attention with fish, and brought him back, and he finally went to Nineveh and preached to the Assyrians, and the Assyrians converted all of them, Jonah was fit to be tied. He didn't want these people to convert. And yet they did. And one of, the, one of the reasons that the book of Jonah is where it is in Scripture, and tells the story it is, is because um, it's right in the middle of stories about prophets of God going to the Israelites, especially the northern kingdom of Israel, you know, Hosea and others, as well as the southern kingdom of Judah, and preaching, some of them for 70 or 80 years, and the people will not turn back to God. These people who have been blessed by God, who were his people, would not convert and turn to the Lord. Jonah preaches once in the capital of Assyria, and the whole city of Nineveh converts, comes, comes to the true God. And it's almost as though it's in there as, as an indictment, an extra special indictment against the stubbornness and the sinfulness of the, of the people of God, the Jews, okay? So, this is the Babylonian Empire, and you'll notice again, it controls uh, Egypt, which was, that was the capstone of any effort to control this part of the world, because Egypt was the oldest, and in many ways the richest of all the cultures, entirely because of the Nile River. You'll notice that this shows just the Nile. Desert over here, Desert over here, the Nile is the only, but the Nile is so rich in terms of every year when the Nile floods, at least behind this very rich black soil, so they grew all kinds of crops. They had developed you know, great wealth because they'd been around so long. Um, and so all of this was controlled by the Babylonian Empire. All right? um, again, this is an artist's conception, as well as this, of what the city of Babylon would look like. It was um, without question, the most important, the, the largest, richest, most powerful city um, in, the, in this period of time, in the 7th, 6th century BC, that anybody had ever known. Um, it was the site of one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, which is the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar, you know, that Nebuchadnezzar, the one you hear about, that you read about Daniel, etc., one of his wives, Amethis, was from Persia, Iraq. Uh, Iraq. Uh, Iran, Iraq, you know, there, there weren't the same lines then. And she had come from an area where there were a lot of trees and greens. The story is that she was in the in the <coughs> Babylon, which is near Baghdad, you know what that looks like. She, all of the sand and the dry and the whole thing, so you know, you know, surrounding, and she missed the greenery. So the story is that Nebuchadnezzar, her husband, built the Hanging uh, Gardens of Babylon, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, so that there would be fruit trees and grass and vines and things that made her feel more at home. So Nebuchadnezzar and his wife, Amidas, uh, were responsible for this. Now, there's questions as to whether it ever really was, but there's, you know, the tradition for it is very, very strong. Um, you get, it, this is actually, this, this is called the Ishtar Gate. There were a number of fortified gates that led into the city of Babylon. The, the largest and most impressive was the Ishtar Gate. It's covered with these uh, sculpt, relief sculptures in colored tile of lions and of the dragons of Marduk. Um, 
Marduk was the primary god of the Babylonians. And this gate led into the main procession that led a processional road, a large uh, boulevard road lined with sculptures of animals that led down to the main temple, the Ziggurat Temple of Marduk. Um, this is now in Berlin. <laughs> uh, it's not the real one because it's all destroyed, but they have, you know, they have tiles of it and everything else. They've reconstructed it, and it's now in the Pergamum Museum in Berlin, which is kind of strange because Pergamum is an ancient city in what we know of as Turkey. It has nothing to do with Babylon, but it's in the Pergamum Museum in Berlin. Um, the, the thing, the, to give you an idea of the scale, these walls around the city were 16 kilometers. So the main part of the city, that's not all of it, people lived outside the walls, but the walled city was 16 kilometers around. The gates were considered impregnable. But you will notice that the river, the Tigris River runs through it, or uh, Euphrates River, sorry, Euphrates, runs through it. And they had, you know, they had gates with a very deep river and it ran through the city so that they had access to water, but they had bars that ran down into the water so that you know, they believe that nobody can hold their breath long enough to get down there, get underneath, and come back up again, much less an army. Well, Babylon was conquered by the Persians, Cyrus the Great. In fact, we have the story of Belshazzar, which is the grandson, not the son actually, they call him son, but that means descendant. The grandson of Nebuchadnezzar is having a big party, and he's, he's partying, and he, they are all getting drunk, he and his wives and concubines and drinking buddies. And they call for the servants to bring the gold plates and cups and things that, that were taken from the temple in Jerusalem that had been dedicated to God. And they're drinking out of this stuff. And all of a sudden, this hand appears. And this finger writes on the wall. And they don't know what it says, so they call for Daniel, who by this time is a very old man, to come and interpret it for them and promise him all sorts of wealth and everything. He said, keep your wealth. I'll tell you what it says. It says, you, Belshazzar, has been, have been weighed in uh, scales and been found wanting, and this very night your kingdom will be taken from you. Well, other records say that Cyrus conquered the Babylonians during a big festival. In fact, what he did was they, they diverted the river <coughs> upstream so that it, uh, the, the stories are that so that the soldiers were only five deep in the water of the river, where it, and they were able to get under the okay. gates. They entered the city that way without a fight, and you'll notice there's there's kind of there's like a central city. Everybody was gathered in the central city for this party. They had no opposition until they had already taken over the vast majority of the city, and then they surrendered. It was almost a bloodless conquering, where Cyrus the Great and the Persians conquered the city of Babylon. All right. Now, how did they, excuse me, how did they divert the, the river? Well, they, dam you know, they dug a channel in one direction, then they dammed it up so that the water had to go somewhere else and it didn't make it to the city there. Is there, is there uh, archaeological... Uh, no, no, we have record of that. I mean, I in, in, the, in the annals, like the Persian annals and things like that, we're told that's how they did it. But that we don't is, have any. In cool. fact, the whole, this whole thing, spectacular as it is, there's nothing now but a mound of dirt. They have dug up, dug up some things from that, but it's called a tell. In the, in, in the uh, ancient Near East, the, the, these big mounds of dirt under which there are ruins are called tells. And you'll read about, you know, tell Bahrain and various other things. Um, Saddam Hussein had intended to rebuild the city of Babylon. In fact, he started it. But from his summer palace, which is right at the old city of Baghdad, he would look out and you could see the tell from his palace. And so he had started to rebuild it. And um, obviously, he had other things that began to occupy his attention. Uh, so Saddam Hussein did not finish that. But it's not, you know, again, they found lots of, lots of bricks and things like that. They've got a sense of the outline of it. But there's no, you know, you can't point to it now and say, that's the, oh, there's the city of Babylon. Um, so you get an idea of the grandeur of it. This, is um, an artist's impression of King Nebuchadnezzar. Um, these are two paintings that represent the destruction of the southern kingdom of Judah. Now again, the northern kingdom of Israel destroyed by the Assyrians in 722 BC. About 150, well, 120 years later, around 905, the Babylonians actually defeat the southern kingdom and they take some people off into deportation, but they don't destroy the city. 
Then one of the kings, this is a time when the Babylonians and the Egyptians were vying for power. Well, at various times, after the Babylonians first conquered the city of Jerusalem and the southern kingdom of Judah, the respective kings, Jehoiakim, Jehoiakim, and others, um, they would say, okay, I think the Egyptians are getting strong enough now, we should side with them. They would, and the Babylonians would sweep in and, you know, smack them around again and take more people off in deportation. There actually were three deportations. The last one was in 586 when the Nebuchadnezzar and his army came in and they said, that's it. You know, you keep doing this. We're not going to put up with it anymore. They destroy the city of Jerusalem for the most part. They completely destroy the temple and burn it. Carry um, a, the largest number, most of the people of the southern kingdom of Judah off into captivity, you know, deportation. Um, I thought I had... Hang on, hang on, hang on. Just a second, I'm going to flip through this because I thought I had... Apparently I don't. I thought I had a drawing of that, uh, with a diagram of that as well. But they took, the Babylonians took the people of the southern kingdom of Judah off into captivity. Now, the difference is the Assyrians were a lot more bloodthirsty. They killed a lot more people. And the people they took off into captivity, they spread them out everywhere. The Babylonians took the southern kingdom of Judah, the people of the southern kingdom of Judah, into exile. But they took them all to one, one or two places. So they stayed together as a community. They maintained their identity in a way that the northern kingdom had not been able to because of the different tactics that the southern the, the Babylonians did in the south versus the Assyrians in the north. So they, let, they kept them together. They let them keep their sense of identity. They had a community. And so you have, you know, you have references like, by the rivers of Babylon, we, we wept. Well, we, you know, we're there. They were still trying to figure out how do we keep being Jews when everything's changed, all right? Excuse now, me. Excuse me, is that, is that an altar? Was that an altar? What is that? Oh, that's just the walls of the of part of the old city. It looks like an altar because it's got the horns. It's got the horns. Like, but no, that's, that's a... a big altar. That may have been symbolic in some way, and it's probably just this, this artist's conception. But this is the actual burning of the city, and then with the city burning in the background, the people, you know, fleeing and you know, being taken off, that kind of thing. Excuse me. Yeah. This may be a very simplistic question, but how can they burn what is made of stone? Well, what they would do, uh, it's surprising what will burn. Um, concrete has a burn rate. You know. um, the, what, they would burn everything inside, because inside there would be things made out of wood, and thatch, etc. Once they had built fires against these stone walls, the mortar would tend to crumble, you know, because the mortar yes. is made out of mud and, you know, straw and other things. It's not made out of rock. And so the mortar would, would uh, be damaged or destroyed by the fire, and then the walls would cave in. Okay. So, uh, yeah, when they talk about burning the city of Jerusalem, the stones didn't burn, but everything else did sufficient that the walls then were unable to be sustained. Okay? Anything else about that? The walls and uh, wood paneling and the roof was all the, the, the timbers? In the, in the temple, temple proper, yes. So yeah, there was wood involved in all of that. So, okay, so how did the uh, exile, now, the, the exile of the northern tribes was so effectively done by the Assyrians that they didn't retain any sense of identity. It didn't have any effect on them because there wasn't anybody to affect anymore. You know, they were done. But the southern people, the southern tribes in the kingdom of Judah, um, Judah and Benjamin, when they were taken off into captivity, they later were allowed to return. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. But the Babylonian exile had a huge effect on the Jews. Now think about this. The Jews knew, and they had the record of the Hebrew Bible, you know, up until then. They were the chosen people of God. He had especially picked them. He had blessed them. He had anointed them. He had given them the promised land. He, his very presence had resided in the temple itself. And by the way, the, the, uh, we're talking of this affects the time period that we're talking about with the historical books, if you want to read more about the details of this, then read the book of Jeremiah and the book of Lamentations, which was written by the prophet Jeremiah. They are both records of the time leading up to and at the destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonians, and then Lamentations is, is an appeal of grief or a declaration of grief over that. So there are other places in the Bible besides the historical books that deal with this. But we need to understand this in order to understand some of what the Jews were going through, and especially the, the, the basis for the books of Chronicles. Now, first of, all, first of all, the Babylonian exile left the Jews wondering if God still loved them and if they were still a special people. 
or had their relationship with God been completely broken? And Jeremiah, in the, in the book of Jeremiah, he actually, as the Babylonians are approaching, and, and, they, and the Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem because of the unfaithfulness of the people. All right? It's not because they were, their God was stronger than, than the one true God, but God allowed it to happen because of the unfaithfulness of the people. So they're wondering, is God's judgment a sign of the fact that, that we don't have a chance anymore? That we're completely out of God's favor? We're no longer his people? So that was a real serious question. Secondly, they were unsure how they were supposed to be the people of God when all the things that represented their election as God's people, especially the promised land and the temple, had been taken from them or destroyed. Remember, God had promised them, you know, the, the, the declaration of God's covenant was, I will give you a land to be your own. I will make you a great people. I will give you a land to be, you a land to be the, your own, and you will be a blessing to all peoples. That's what he promised Abraham, then Isaac, then Jacob. And he said, I will reside in this temple. This, my presence will be there. Well, now the promised land was gone. They didn't have it anymore. The temple had been destroyed. Where's God's presence? How do we be the people of God without the, all the things that made us the people of God? Joanna. Yes, but he also had a little statement beyond that that said, but if you don't follow you, I will not be able Right, and they knew that. But understand, they're, they, they knew that part. They're going, but is there anything we can do to go back? Okay. Can, we, can we get our relationship with God back now that the promised land is gone, now that the temple has been destroyed and the presence of God isn't, doesn't seem to be here anymore? Now what do we do? You know, they understood because the prophets kept telling them, these are the consequences of you not being obedient. Okay. Third, they didn't know how to worship without a temple. They now were in the same place that Jeroboam had been in in the north when they didn't have the northern... Uh, kingdom didn't have access to the temple. How do we worship God? We can't sacrifice animals because God had made it very clear. You don't just do that anywhere. They almost had a civil war when the Transjordanian tribes, when they're headed back across the Jordan to the east to, to settle, when they built a, they said it was a monument of remembrance. Well, the other tribes thought it was a, a, an altar to sacrifice on. They almost went to war against the other tribes because that's how serious it was to even contemplate having a sacrificial system anywhere other than in the temple. Everything about their worship was focused on the temple. Without a temple, what do we do? And this is why the first group of Jews that went back to Jerusalem went back to do what? You know, rebuild the temple. Because they didn't know how to Jews without it. In fact, it was in the absence of the temple that the whole synagogue system really developed. They had had sort of houses of prayer, synagogues, even during the time of the temple, like in the, in the Galilee in the north, because it was a long way to go to the temple. But the synagogue as a place of, um, of study, and this is one of the times that study became so important to the Jewish people. Because in the absence of the sacrificial system, in the absence of a priestly order to have services, what are we supposed to do? And they said, well, we can at least study the Word of God. We can at least learn what it means to be a Jew in a better way. Uh, we can pray. And so synagogues became places of study. Frequently they had schools associated with them. They became places of prayer, and they became community centers because another fear that the Jews had was a fear of being assimilated and losing their sense of being a people, losing their sense of being unique as the people of God. They had already seen that happen to the northern, the ten northern tribes when the Assyrians took them off into captivity about 136 years earlier. They had seen that the fact that they had gotten annihilated as a people; they didn't exist anymore as as Jewish tribes. And so the people of Judah, while they had not been treated the same way, they were still in groups. They, were, they had their own little communities in, in Babylonia. When they thought about, well, without a temple, without the city of Jerusalem, are we just going to be assimilated like the northern tribes were? Are we going to stop being the Jewish people like they thought the Samaritans had? And so they started with the synagogues, and the synagogues became community centers as much as anything else. Any Jewish, any town that has a synagogue now, it'll not only be a place of learning and a place of prayer, but it'll be a community center where they, they gather together to celebrate Jewish holidays, to celebrate birthdays and bar mitzvahs and everything, try to maintain a sense of community. Well, that's what happened with them in Babylon, the southern kingdom of Judah, and trying to maintain their sense of who they were as Jews by the synagogue system. When they returned, they started to build a temple as a place of worship, and but what's the next thing they did after they, they started rebuilding the temple? 
they, they tried to build it, they rebuilt the city. They actually, it was in between thing we'll talk about with Ezra, where they, they started reteaching the law, you know, and started refocusing on, on their religious practice, which they'd sort of lost. But then they started rebuilding the city so that they would have a focal point. You know, they would have a locus for what it meant to be the people of God again, which they didn't have. All of those things really were in response to the devastation, the psychological, emotional, national devastation that they experienced with the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. Okay? Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. All right. Then we come to the book of Chronicles. And we're going to take a break right now and then come back and talk about Chronicles. And you will see, hopefully, very quickly why all of this was important as a preface to studying First and Second Chronicles. So let's take a break. I've got 10 minutes still. We will come back at uh, so, 3 o'clock. Nope. So just they, two. they were gone a long time before that. They were gone. In fact, that's why when you get into Chronicles, for instance, they don't, other, other than trying to make a couple of minor points, they don't even talk about the kings of the northern kingdom of, of Israel. The focus is entirely this, the kings of the southern kingdom of Judah because that's all that was left. <laughs> and that also, because David is so important in there, those were the ones that were heirs to the promise of David. The northern kings were not. They were not descendants of David. So the northern kingdom is pretty much out of sight, out of mind. They're gone. We're not, we're not even really thinking about them anymore. Okay? We'll take a break. We'll start back at, three, at uh, 2 o'clock. Let's talk about First and Second Chronicles. Um, let me acknowledge right up front that Chronicles is hard to read. <laughs> and let me give you three reasons why Chronicles seem so hard to us. One, it's really long. The two books together are very long. Um, again, remember that 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, and Ezra and Nehemiah originally were one, each of them were one book. The book of Kings, the book of uh, Samuel, the book of Chronicles, the book of Ezra and Nehemiah. They were split up into two books each when the Hebrew Bible was translated into the Septuagint um, 300 years before Jesus. Well, the reason is because Greek takes a lot more room than Hebrew. Hebrew doesn't have any vowels in it. Um, and the, as a language, Hebrew is much more concise than Greek is. So when they translated into Greek, they had a whole lot more stuff, and it, you couldn't put it on, on you know, all of the Book of Kings on one scroll, so they split in two. And in some ways, it's really unfortunate. For instance, First and Second Chronicles get split in a really awkward place, because the story of, King, of uh, David's ascent and rule and Solomon's ascent and rule really ought to be one piece, but they split it right in the middle between these two books. So, it's hard to read because it's long. It's hard to read because a lot of it repeats stuff that you will have recently read in this class from, from the book of 2 Samuel to the book of 2 Kings. A lot of that story of David and Solomon are repeated in the books of Chronicles. And the thing most people have trouble with is the first nine chapters of First Chronicles is the genealogy. Just like people who, in their enthusiasm to start reading the Bible, start in Genesis 1, and they're great for four chapters, and then they get to Genesis 5, which are all the begats. <laughs> or Matthew or Luke, both of them have genealogies as two, but they don't have nine chapters worth of genealogies like, um, like Chronicles does. And I'm going to talk about why that's important, and why it actually isn't something we ought to just skip over. There's a very <laughs> important reason why those genealogies are there in Chronicles, and why... They go all the way back to Adam. The genealogies and Chronicles, unlike in, you know, uh, in Matthew, for instance, they go all the way back to Adam, and they give us that record. Now, a little bit more background. Um, we call this Chronicles, which is based upon what Jerome named it, when he, in the 5th century, he translated the, um, the Hebrew Bible into Latin and became the Latin Vulgate, which was the official Bible of the Catholic Church for, for ever. Um, in it, he called it the Chronicon, which basically means the, um, the story of the, the Chronicles of Days. The Chronicles are the, you know, the telling of the times. Uh, the Hebrew name for it was the, translated the matter of the days. And interestingly enough, when they translated the Septuagint in Greek, I mentioned, uh, they actually called it the things left out, which means... They perceived it as being just bits and pieces of stuff that didn't get included in Samuel and Kings. Well, that's not a good name for it. That's not 
what this is all about. Um, as I say, it begins with Adam. It has all these genealogical uh, lists, but it emphasizes especially the reign of David and the reign of Solomon. But Solomon, they're especially interested in Solomon's building of the temple more than anything else. You don't get the story of the Queen of Sheba and all that kind of stuff so much as you get the emphasis on Solomon building the temple. Then we get into the kings of Judah. The only references in the Chronicles to the kings of the northern kingdom of Israel are where they especially represented a bad example or contributed somehow to something that was happening in the south. Everything else is about the kingdom of Judah and all their kings. Again, because those were the descendants of David, and that was the part that mattered now, because all of the people that they're writing to in the post-exile are people who were from the southern kingdom of Judah. None of the northern kingdom people are around anymore. So they don't really talk about that. That's so, not a particular interest to them. Excuse me, you said this was in post-exilic? Exactly. Now let me talk about what that means. Um, the, well, first let me give you the, a, a brief history, and then we'll talk about why we say this is post-exilic. The books of Chronicles are focused on mostly this period of time. Now again, they go all the way back to Adam, and they give us a genealogy leading up to this. But uh, the, the real focal point is the period in between the start of David's reign, his ascent as kingship, through the end of the Babylonian exile. The last passage in 2 Chronicles is that per, uh, Cyrus the Great, the king of Persia, issues an edict that will allow the Jews to go back home. That's where Chronicles ends. So it's all of this. It talks about King David, which was, uh, his reign was 40 years between 1010 and 970 BC. And then the 40 years of Solomon's reign as king, from 970 to 930. And in the middle there, very important, around 960, is the building of the temple. A major emphasis in Chronicles. Uh, in fact, if you want to say what are the two major topics that Chronicles is concerned about, it is the reign of King David and the building of the temple. Why? Because God's promise to David that he would be the king and that all kings after would be his heirs is, and it is the ideal example of God's promise that he has fulfilled or will fulfill. The building of the temple. God had promised. He had talked to David about it and said, I don't want you to build it. But Chronicles is the only place that we have a long description of the fact that David got ready to build the temple. He had designs drawn up. He gathered all the, the gold and the silver and the jewels and the wood and everything necessary. He collected all this and had it all ready for his son Solomon to build. We don't have that record um, in, in the earlier books about David being that involved in pre preparing for the temple. So David as being the great king that God has anointed and given a covenant promise to, and the temple which God had anointed, called to be built, and promised his presence in as the symbol of the worship of the Israelites, those are the two major themes that get developed. That's why the kings that... that um, that Chronicles talks about are almost entirely kings that had something significant to do with the temple. There were some very important political kings, you know, who had big, big activities in terms of conquering or fighting battles or wars that are barely mentioned at all. But kings that, that we don't hear a lot about uh, in the books of, of kings are emphasized greatly in Chronicles because they did something that had a major effect on the temple. For instance, Manasseh who was the son of Hezekiah, the grandfather of Josiah, Hezekiah and Josiah being two really good kings, Manasseh was one of the worst. He does horrible things. In fact, the, when he's talked about in the book of Kings, they just, just say, and Manasseh came along and he, he, he did not do what his father did. He offended God. He was a really bad person. And then they go on. In Chronicles, we're told that Manasseh was taken off into exile by the Babylonians, and in exile, he... Um, repented of his sin, came back to the Lord, and was blessed by that. So Chronicles tells us more about Manasseh than Kings did, and tells us part of the story about what happens because he returned to the Lord. It's believed that the, the writer of Chronicles, which traditionally is Ezra, and may very well be, that he was a priest, and his concern is to, to view everything in terms of the temple, the fulfillment of God's promise, the return of people to proper worship of God as a priest would be concerned. Yes? 
Um, I think also it said, and correct me on this, everywhere else it just said David was not to build a temple. Mm -hmm. God told him not to. But then in Chronicles it says that David was told the whole arrangement about the temple, and, and he's the one that literally did the whole blueprint. Get ready, get ready for it. But right. Solomon will be the one to actually build it. Right. But I thought that was amazing because before it was like, you're not going to have anything to do with it. Your son will. And in the meantime, then, then it, this one says, oh, he had plenty to do with it. Yeah. I mean, he literally just practically said, here, I've gathered everything for you, and here's the layout, right. and uh, here's what to do. But he didn't actually build it. So it's not contradictory. Right. It's it wasn't. It was just more of a point that um, exactly. I thought it was a, a good point that God was very much uh, letting him have a hand in it without, right. without doing it. And recognizing that the importance of David as God's anointed king and the importance of the temple as God's anointed uh, place, his residence, his throne on earth, that to give us a lot of more detail about how David was involved in preparation for the temple, <clears throat> not building it but preparing for it, really ties those two things together. And there's a lot of material in here on that. Okay? Um, then, of course, the first temple built in 960, then 930, Israel splits in the northern and southern kingdom. This is after Solomon's death and his son Rehoboam proves to be unwise, and now he deals with the people. And Jeroboam takes over the ten kingdoms in the north. In 722, the northern kingdom of Israel, after Jer counting Jeroboam and after it, they never had a good king. They all offended God. They all worshipped other gods. They all did things that were not what God wanted. And so they were destroyed first by the Assyrians. The Assyrians were used as a tool. We're told they were the tool of God to deal in judgment against the northern kingdom of Israel for not being obedient. And then, about 115 or 120 years later, in 605, we have the first defeat of the southern kingdom and the kings of Jerusalem uh, by the Babylonians. They take some people off into captivity. There are actually three deportations of the Jews over that time. As I told you, various of the kings of uh, Judah at that time were, they didn't want to be under anybody's thumb. And so they kept thinking, okay, Egypt is getting stronger, let's side with Egypt now. And the Babylonians would hear about it, they'd sweep in, you know, defeat them again and take off more people. It was during these deportations that Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were included in the deportations, and that's how they ended up in Babylon, the capital city, as part of the court of Nebuchadnezzar in the book of Daniel. You wonder how they showed up there? It was during this time of deportation. All right. Then finally, they had had enough, and Nebuchadnezzar comes in, in in 586, destroys the city of Jerusalem, carries pretty much everybody except some very poor workers that were left to take care of the vineyards and fields, we're told, and destroys the temple. And that was the end of the southern kingdom of Judah and any aspect, in terms of nationality, of the, the nation of Israel, okay? Now, they're off in, from 586 on, they're off in Babylon, or they actually had some, some areas near Babylon where they were gathered as people. Only about 50 years later, I described to you how Cyrus, the king of Persia, Cyrus the Great or Cyrus the First, how he conquered Babylonia and the city of Babylon in one night with almost no bloodshed. And again, we read about that toward the end of Daniel when Belshazzar, the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar, is having a party, and God tells him by the finger, the handwriting on the wall, that your kingdom will, will lose your kingdom tonight. Right? So, Persia conquers Babylon, and one of the it says in the first year of the reign of Cyrus of Persia, and this is at the end of Chronicles, we're told, Cyrus issued an edict that all of the people of his conquered lands could return to their homeland. Now recognize, Persia conquered everything that had been Assyria, and then everything that had been Babylonia, which was mostly the same thing, they just went in sequence. And both Persia, or both Assyria and Babylon, uh, Babylonia, had had the habit, when they conquered people, to deport them somewhere else. Cyrus the Great of Persia took exactly the opposite approach. He said, I'm not going to try to def, you know, beat these people down so they don't want to rebel. I'm going to make them like me. And I'm going to do that by telling them, and not just the Jews, but everybody, that you now can return to wherever your homeland was before you were conquered by the Assyrians or the Babylonians or whoever else. You can return to your home. And he specifically had an edict that said the Jews that were in his kingdom now 
could return to Jerusalem and rebuild the Holy Temple of the Lord. And they could take back with them all of the articles that the Babylonians had stolen from the temple. And so the first return after Cyrus's edict was the governor, Zerubbabel, and some others went back and they started rebuilding the temple. The temple in Jerusalem, always on the same site, is called Mount Moriah, which is the high point on, on the eastern part of Jerusalem has been the site of three different temples. First, there was Solomon's temple, all right, the temple that David prepared for and Solomon built. That gets destroyed by the Babylonians in 586. Then, 50 years later or so, Zerubbabel is named governor by Cyrus the Great. He returns with a group of, of Jews, and they begin building a second temple to replace the first one. Well, they actually talk about, in some of the prophetic writings, that it was a pretty pitiful thing compared to Solomon's temple. It wasn't very big, it wasn't very beautiful, they didn't have gold, they didn't have jewels, they didn't have any of the stuff that made the first one look so spectacular, um, but they were trying. Then, after Zerubbabel's temple, in the time of Jesus, um, Herod the Great comes along. Herod the Great was the great builder. That was probably the only thing he was really great at, other than controlling things. And he was a great architect and a great builder, and he rebuilt the temple you know, pretty much got rid of Zerubbabel's false start and built the, the temple, which is called the second temple period because they don't even really count Zerubbabel's efforts. <laughs> the, the second temple period was when Herod the Great rebuilt the temple to equal or even exceed the grandeur of the temple in Solomon's day. That's the temple that existed when Jesus was there and, P, and Paul was there, etc. And then that temple got destroyed by the Romans in AD 70. Right? For the same reason that the Babylonians had destroyed the first temple because of rebellion. Now, so that gives you kind of a perspective in terms of what has happened there. Now, what is the Book of Chronicles all about? First, usually in, histor in historical references, they just refer to the Chronicle. Traditionally, it is the prophet Ezra, or the priest Ezra. Um, in between Zerubbabel going back and re starting to rebuild the temple, and later on, Nehemiah going back in the book of Nehemiah and rebuilding the city walls. In between, Ezra, who was a priest, goes back to Jerusalem with a bunch of his, a uh, bunch of other people. It was the, the second return. And he comes back because he was a teacher of the law. He was a priest and teacher of the law. And he starts teaching the people the Mosaic law again because they hadn't had the temple to, to be a place of worship and a focal point for the religion. They had begun to forget a lot of what the law was all about. So Ezra goes back and starts teaching it, and he starts trying to straighten the people up in correct ways in which they have strayed from God's will, especially intermarrying non-Jewish people. Uh, the intermarriage between Jewish men and um, Canaanite women had gotten to be a real problem, and Ezra, when he back straight, went back, straightened some of that up. In fact, I have a, I have a page from the King James Bible from, um, from Ezra and Nehemiah, and the caption on it is, who put away strange wives. Strange wives meaning women who are from strange peoples. I thought that was very appropriate. Well, Carol has always appreciated the fact that I have that version of the Bible, who put away strange wives. So I tell her to be careful. Um, the date of this, it is post-exilic. And the reason we know that is because included in the writing, at the end of Second Chronicles, is the, the decree or the edict of, bless you, of, not the edict of <laughs> the edict of Cyrus, who says the Jews can return home. That was the end of the exile. So this was written sometime after this. Um, I've got here 500 BC or later. Most scholars believe it was probably written in the 400s or perhaps as early as 350 even. Because uh, the theme and purpose is to encourage the remnant, that is, uh, the remnant of returnees to Jerusalem. It's not like you know, 100,000 of them went home. They were fairly small groups of people that actually went back. By this time, they had spent several generations living in a foreign land. They had stopped speaking Hebrew as their everyday language. They had started speaking Aramaic, right? You all know Jesus and others spoke Aramaic as their everyday language. Aramaic was the language of the Babylonians. It's a version of Chaldean, which was the Babylonian language. So they were very much part of the Babylonian uh, community at that point. So there was not a huge number of people who returned. 
relatively small, and they were probably feeling uh, a little unsettled, <laughs> so to speak. So this book is written to encourage those who had returned to Jerusalem by retelling them the history and the experience of the Israelites, and especially about their glory under King David, about the magnificence of the temple. This is why Chronicles goes all the way back to Adam, because it's a letter trying to encourage them, saying, think about all God has done, all the way back from the creation of Adam, and how from Adam on, every generation was one more step to get us to the place where God's will was completely made manifest by giving us, the, you know, from Abraham and his descendants, giving us the promised land, and he goes, the, goes through a genealogy of all 12 tribes of Israel, and all of the patriarchs, and all of the Levites, and the remnant, you know, the genealogy of those who are present as the remnant returning to Jerusalem. It's a way of saying, think about all, God has never turned loose of you. God has always been involved from Adam on to bring us to where we are. Do not be discouraged. Because once they got back to Jerusalem, of course, everybody initially thought, wow, we're back. It's going to be great. We'll rebuild the temple. We'll rebuild the city. We'll be Jews again in the right way. It'll be, well, all of a sudden it was hard. The people around them were fighting against them, not wanting them to do it. People were complaining back to the Persian king, saying, you do know that these people are not very loyal to you, and you need to stop this. Everything continued to go wrong. And some of the people... While they thought we're returning to the promised land and we're going to be proper Jews again now, they thought what was going to happen is God was going to fulfill his promise for a Messiah. Because God had been promising a Messiah. That in the, in the fullness of time, I will send my anointed one to fulfill everything. And so they get back to Jerusalem and it's like every morning they wake up thinking, maybe today's the day. The Messiah's going to come back. We're ready to go. And it hadn't happened. And it hadn't happened hadn't happened. And so they went from, you know, 538 or so, 538, 539, when the first ones went back, we've gotten 100 or 150 years later, and they're still struggling. The temple is pretty lame. It's not the great temple of, of, of Solomon. It's the temple of Zerubbabel, and the reason why you probably don't remember Zerubbabel's name is because of the temple he built. And I'm sure he did the best he could, but they weren't rich. They were refugees. You know, in effect, Jerusalem was a refugee camp at that point. And so they were struggling. And the book of Chronicles is an effort to have them remember all God has done throughout their history. Yes? Where was the ark at this time? Um, the ark was carried off. And uh, that was part of what apparently the Babylonians had taken. It, it was lost. Now, one story is that Solomon, before his fall, he sent it to the Queen of Sheba. In fact, the Queen of Sheba is sometimes identified as the Queen of Arabia. Uh, I, think, I think it's more accurate to think of her as the Queen of Ethiopia. And in Ethiopia, the great, there was a great civilization there, which you probably haven't heard of, because we don't hear about things that aren't part of our history. Uh, the, the civilization called the, the Empire of Axum, A-X-U-M or A-X-X-U-M. It was believed the Queen of Sheba was one of the ones who really founded that, and it remained for almost 2,000 years a major civilization. There still today is a, a church, which is not available, not, people, public people don't have access to it, you can't go there, that has a priest that is responsible for that, and the Ethiopian Coptic Church claims that the Ark of the Covenant is inside that church, but no one's allowed to see it, because they believe people will try to take it. And the priests are appointed for life, and their only responsibility is to maintain that one church. And it's fenced off. You can't get to it. Nobody else can go in there, only the one priest. Now, they claim that the Ark of the Covenant was given by Solomon toward the end of his life to the Queen of Sheba, and she maintained it, and they kept it there, and it's still there. That's their claim. Nobody can prove it. But we don't know what happened to the Ark of the Covenant. All right? Some people said the Babylonians carried it off and it got lost or destroyed or melted down or who knows what. Of course, some people believe that the Nazis tried to capture it for a time and then it ended up, you know, in a box in a warehouse somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> that was <laughs> the, <story laughs> was the, right? the only reason that story works is because we don't know. Yeah. I have a question, Ross. Um, and this goes back to the conquest of Babylon. Right. You said that the, the, you know, the river was diverted and the army marched in and went under the graders, you know. Mm -hmm. And you said there was a party. Was that 
are, are, it, are you referring to that party in the inner city where everybody was there? Is that the, the, the part of the, of the Belshazzar? The Belshazzar, and that was Darius, the Mede that comes in and takes over? Well, the thing, there's two, two interpretations of that. The first king of Persia, the one that conquered Babylon, was Cyrus the Great, Cyrus the First. Either Darius was his general, who went in first, or Darius is another name for Cyrus. There's two different two different opinions about that, because we know that Cyrus was we're, the first king. We're talking about then that the, 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 when you read this, and, and the handwriting on the wall, and the city is overtaken, the backdrop to that is that, meanwhile, the, the water level was dropping because the, the beasts had already incredible. The record, the historical record we have from extra biblical or outside the Bible sources, dovetail exactly with the story in Daniel where Belshazzar, they're having a big festival and a big party, and him and his drinking buddies, and they see the handwriting on the wall, and, and the handwriting says, this day, your empire will be taken from you. And it was that night that Cyrus the Great, who was identified as Darius in the Bible, but again, either that was his general, which oftentimes, the same thing was true with Sennacherib had a general who went, you know, Nebuchadnezzar had a general who went. Either it was, Darius was the general, because later on there's a king Darius that comes as a, as a subsequent to Cyrus's rule in Persia. But it may have been that, you know, he had a Cyrus Darius Almaticus the fourth, you know, kind of whatever. And that at different times he uses different names are used. That's quite common. I mean, we run into the same thing in the book of Esther. Some translations use the name Ahasuerus, King Ahasuerus, and some of them use what we think is the name that people know him by, which is King Xerxes the first. And so sometimes he's referred to as one and sometimes as the other. We believe the same thing might have been true of Cyrus. Okay? Yes, Marvin. What possible reason would Solomon have to give away the Ark of the Covenant? Well, if he, if he, if he saw problems occurring, <laughs> you know, he saw that, that uh, perhaps he knew his son, he knew this wasn't going to go well, and as he approached the end of his life, perhaps it was an act of penance of the fact that he himself had been worshipping other gods and maybe he didn't feel worthy. I don't know. I don't know if that makes any sense to me. <laughs> well, it, it, we have no other, we have, we have no sure knowledge of what happened to the army. Yeah, it's just really... one theory is because the Ethiopians claimed to have it, and the Ethiopians claimed what happened was Solomon sent it to the Queen of Sheba, um, that it may, for whatever whatever his motivation was, maybe because he knew his son was going to mess it up, maybe he knew that he had not honored God and that God was going to take the kingdom from him, maybe God told him to, I don't know. Well, it made more sense to me that in the fifth year of Rehoboam's reign, when uh, the Egyptians came and went through and they took everything, mm -hmm. they probably took the ark too. Maybe so, but we yeah. don't know. Back here first, and then you can. The, the, of course, the Queen of Sheba had a son by Solomon, supposedly. That's the rumor. And, and that... That may have been part of the motivation. As well. In fact, it's interesting if you read it, the story of uh, Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. At the very end, it says, "And when Sheba left, when King Sheba left, Solomon gave her more than she had brought him." <laughs> That's what it says. Which, which I always thought was an interesting euphemism that she really was pregnant. Okay. <laughs> so, I was just going to say that if, if you if you treat just just the scripture as to what happened to the ark. The last time it is seen is seen by John on Patmos in his vision of heaven. And whether he saw something, just a vision, a dream, or whether he literally saw uh, something more tangible into the heavens, the last evidence that you have of the ark is it's been translated to heaven. So there's, there's there that's may so be, that, that's not without, beyond the scope of God's possibility. Okay, so the important part to, uh, to remember about Chronicles is it is being written as an encouragement to these post-exilic Jews who had returned to Jerusalem but were living as refugees and who had had high, such high expectations that God was going to make everything right and for 100 or 150 years now since they first returned, things have not been right. They have continued to struggle. And so this is a book to encourage them to remember. Don't forget the extraordinary ways that God has acted on your behalf. From Adam on, every step along the way, God has been involved. And the thing you need to remember about those genealogies is that every name in that is a person. And every person represents some step in God's the fulfillment of God's plan. Now, um, have any of you all been involved in genealogy for your own family? Okay, you have. If you write out all that genealogy and you hand it to somebody who doesn't know you and have them read it, what's their reaction going to be? Oh, 
<laughs> but if those are your ancestors, what is your reaction? Man, this is cool. This is fascinating stuff. The people this was written for, these were their ancestors. These were people they were related to. Not only that, but they knew those stories. In fact, I'll tell you this. The more you learn the stories of the Old Testament, the more you, 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 know, you spend time with it and you remember it, so that when you read the name Gideon, or you read, you know, the you know the tribe of the uh, clan of the Kohathites, you read that reference in First Chronicles, and you go, oh yeah, that was cool, that was a great story, I love that one. Oh, you remember when that happened? So one of the reasons why we read this and it's boring to us is because we haven't really studied, we don't really know all of the history that's behind it. Every one of those names in the genealogy is is a person, and it's a story about that person. In shorthand. Yeah. And so for them, the people who this was written for, they knew all those stories. For them, this meant something. Each one of those names represents a person, and every one of those people was a building block in God's plan for the Israelites. Yes? In Genesis 6, where they have the, uh, the genealogy there, um, if you translate those names from the Hebrew into the, what they're like, Genesis 5, I think, but yeah. You, you get, you, it's 5, I guess yeah. it is. It, it, it turns into a story. The, 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 the genealogy turns into a story right. about what's happening, uh, just from the translations of the names. Right. And it's also true that, that those genealogies anchor all of the story of the Old Testament, all of the story of God's acts in history are just that. They're anchored in history. This is, if you think about it, this is a way of saying, this all really happened, and here are the names of the people who really lived through whom God caused all this to happen, okay? So, and again, using all those names as a way of leading up, establishing a historical anchor, giving a clear sense of God's building up to the high point, according to the Chronicler, which is the reign of the most pious, most committed of the great kings, in fact, the great king, King David. And then the building of the temple, the physical essence on earth, the element on earth where God swore to leave his presence, and those two things tie together. And as I said, that the fact that David is presented as spending so much effort and money and time preparing for the temple, those two great things, the reign of David and the, and the building of the temple as the, as the home of God, the house of God, really do sink together in that, okay? Um, I'm not going to spend, you know, I, uh, I want to go on and do some other stuff here. There are some key verses. Remember, this stuff is online. Now, this was First Chronicles. It's all really one book, okay? But if we go to Second Chronicles, same author, traditionally Ezra, the priest, 500 B.C. or later, probably actually in the late 4th century, like 350 to 400. But any time in there will work, but it does have to be post-exile which um, meaning 500 or so or later because that's, we actually have a record in Second Chronicles of something that happened in 538, 539, which was the Edict of Cyrus. Again, the theme and purpose is the same, but in this case, to remind the people of their history and especially Solomon. Now, the reason Solomon is talked about is because of the emphasis on the temple. Solomon being the one that built the temple. One of the things that the writer of Chronicles doesn't do is he doesn't get into a lot of the failings. He doesn't talk about Bathsheba and Uriah the Hittite when he's talking about David. He doesn't talk about Solomon's worshiping other gods, or at least permitting it by building the altars to them. Because, not because he's trying to deny anything. He clearly is using the books of Kings and, uh, Samuel and Kings as his source, so he knows people are going to know that. But that's not his point. His point is to try to, it would be in effect to say, well, yeah, all that happened. But my point is that even though all that happened, this is how God continued to act. Through the reign of David and through the reign of Solomon and the period of the divided kingdoms. And again, the divided kingdoms, he mentions a couple of the northern kings, but almost entirely the southern king because those were David's heirs. And he's writing to and about the people who are going back from the Babylonian exile. They were entirely the people of the southern kingdom of Judah. None of them were northern Israelites, okay? So he looks at Solomon's reign, how the temple was built, and then the reign, the glorious reign, you know, there were good parts to Solomon's reign, obviously, early especially, and then his death, the reigns of the kings of Judah, and then he ends 
in chapter 36 with the proclamation of Cyrus of Persia that allows the exiles to return. All of this is, if you had to sum it up in one sentence, is from the very first person, Adam, God has never stopped being involved. Everything is in fulfillment of his will. You are still his people. His plan is not done yet. Be encouraged. And by focusing on the grand things that God has done, you know, the taking of the promised land, the reign of King David, the wealth of Solomon, the building of the glorious temple, those, those high points, it's because he's trying to lift their spirits and make them realize God is still God. He hasn't stopped being God just because the, the days are looking a lot darker now. Don't forget what he's done for you already. All right? Make sense? Yes. Um, and I'm going to come, well, actually I am going to do these verses. I, I changed my mind. In 1 Chronicles, there's a couple of things you can do. For instance, people always quote 2 Chronicles 7. As, because 2 Chronicles 7 is the passage that says, you know, if you, my people, will turn to me and repent of your sins, then I will heal, you know, I will save you and heal your land. Usually that's on a bumper sticker with an American flag. <laughs> the fact is that was not written about America. It was written about the Jews. Now, as Christians, we are heirs to the promise to the Jews. We are heirs to the people of Israel, and we can claim that. But it's really not appropriate to make that a political statement. Okay? Implying that the nation, that the United States is somehow as much the nation is the nation of the people of God as much as Israel was the nation of the people of God. I'm sorry, but we're not. It's just that's, I'm not making a political statement there. I'm saying that historically that's not accurate. And for us to quote that as a way of saying, go America, or go Canada, or go Mexico, or go anything else, really doesn't fit. All right? Just so we're, we need to be aware of these things. You know, that you see that quoted all the time. He specifically is talking to the people of Israel about their nation and their being the chosen people of God. Okay. Um, a couple of verses from 1 Chronicles. 1 Chronicles 11, 1 to 3. This again is establishing the importance of David as the great king. All Israel came together to David at Hebron and said, We are your own flesh and blood. In the past, even while Saul was king, you were the one who led Israel on, her, on their military campaigns. And the Lord your God said to you, you will shepherd my people Israel, and they will, you will become their ruler. When all the elders of Israel had come to King David at Hebron, he made a compact with them at Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel as the Lord had promised through Samuel. You get this, this sort of uplifting energy from that, as though you know, God himself established this in David, and everybody agreed with it. And it's, it's a way of saying, don't forget the greatness that God made happen in your midst in David. And then from 1 Chronicles 29, David praised the Lord in the presence of the whole assembly, saying, Praise be to you, O Lord, God of our father Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Remember, this is written from a pre the Chronicles is written from a priestly perspective. So there very much is an issue of, of worship, of praise to God, of spirituality. And that's the emphasis on David and the temple are issues of... of God being present and worshipped. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor for everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, O Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. Now, God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. The chronicler is saying, this is the promise given by God. God Almighty to you through David. Be encouraged. Okay? And then, from 2 Chronicles, and I've not quoted the 2 Chronicles 7, although commentary, you know, commentators often do as a major verse in here, but I think people misread that so much I didn't use it. Uh, 2 Chronicles 29, 1-3. Hezekiah. Now remember, Hezekiah is the king that held out against the Assyrians, even though he's a little bit reluctant because Isaiah told him to. And defeated is Assyria, the only little island of opposition that remained in all of the whole of the eastern Mediterranean region against the Assyrians was Jerusalem and the little area right around Jerusalem that they controlled because Hezekiah held out and God acted. Hezekiah was 25 years old when he became king and he reigned in Jerusalem 29 years. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord just as his father David has done. You'll notice that all of the subsequent uh, heirs to David are always referred to in their connection to David the great king. In the first month of the first year of his reign, he opened the doors of the temple of the Lord 
and repaired them. And it goes on at great length, much more than Kings does, talking about all the things that Hezekiah did to try to rebuild the temple, to reestablish right worship of the Lord and to honor God. And a great detail about that. And from 2 Chronicles 36, furthermore, all the leaders of the priests and the people became more and more unfaithful. Here's the downside. This, and this is a way of saying, here's why this all went so haywire. Here's why this all went wrong. They were more and more unfaithful, following all the detestable practices of the nations and defiling the temple of the Lord, which he had consecrated in Jerusalem. The Lord, the God of their fathers, sent word to them through his messengers again and again, his messengers being the prophets, because he had pity on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked God's messengers, despised his words, and scoffed at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord was aroused against his people, and there was no remedy. They went too far. He brought up against them the king of the Babylonians, who killed their young men with a sword in the sanctuary, and spared neither young man nor young woman, old man or aged. God handed all of them over to Nebuchadnezzar. He carried them into exile to Babylon, the, rem the remnant who escaped from the sword. Again, the writer of Chronicles is explaining, make sure you understand why this happened. And if you, if you want to recover from that, the way to do it is not fall into the same failings that they had, but rather to worship the Lord your God rightly. Okay? And then... Uh, who, yeah. was, who was that, uh, the king when they found the Bible? Uh, of, of, uh, Josiah. Oh, Josiah? Josiah was king. Josiah was the, the uh, great-grandson of Hezekiah. He was like eight years old when he started. Yeah, he was eight years old when he became king. It was later on, later than that, when they found the book of the law, which we believe to have been either part or all of Deuteronomy, they found during a remodeling of the temple. Um, and the, when you say, well, how does that work? And the, to the Hebrew people, to the Jews, the, the scrolls of the Bible are seen as living things, quite literally. You know, the Word of God is a living thing, you know, active and... Uh, well, the Jews perceive it that way. That's the reason that they have such reverence. You know, they will carry the scrolls wrapped in, you know, velvet casings. They don't touch it when they're reading it. They use a pointer, you know, mm -hmm. to, to follow along when they're reading. Um, and there's, historically, they saw the Bible, the scrolls of the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, what we call the Old Testament, as being a living thing. When a copy of one of the Old Testament scrolls, again, Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, I call it the Old Testament, and a Jew, of course, wouldn't call it that, um, but when any of the scrolls of the Tanakh, of the Hebrew Bible, uh, became too worn, so that they might tear when they, when, you know, when they rolled them on a scroll, they would have racks and there would be two scrolls, and they would roll it from one scroll to the other. That's still how it's done traditionally. Um, it would become so weakened over time and age that it would tear, or that it would um, begin to fade, you know, the letters would begin to fade. They literally would have a burial for that, because they thought it was a living thing. And so in any in the temple and in any house of worship, Jewish house of worship, a synagogue, they would have what was called a, a, a scriptorium. I mean, that's the Latin name for it, scriptorium, which means, that's also a place where they write the scripture, but they would have a place, a room that was like a tomb or a crypt for copies of the scripture that were no longer to be used, and they literally would bury them. The indication is that what apparently happened is that some old copies of this that had been gone out of use and been put away had gotten sealed up over time and they'd forgotten it was there. And when they were doing the remodeling of the temple and tearing out walls and stuff to try to straighten things up, they found this and they found copies of this and they, you know, they start looking at it and they go, we don't even recognize this. And so they took it to Josiah the king and he said, read it to him. And they read the whole thing to him and it says, he tore his clothes because he was aware of the fact that they had gone so far away from the indicate from the directions God had given them. Now you say, well, how did that happen? You had Hezekiah was a really good king. His son Manasseh was one of the worst, and he reigned for a long time before he got taken into exile. Then Manasseh's son uh, Ammon was a really bad king, and then Josiah, who was only eight years old when he became king, and then had to grow up, you know, at least into his late teens, probably before he was ready to deal with it. So you're looking at a period of three generations where they probably didn't care about the temple or about you know the word of God or whether it was there or hidden or anything else. So that's how it could have gotten displaced. Because there were two, two sets of kings that didn't want to know about that. Okay? And then you have this, which is the end 
of the Book of Chronicles. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia. Now Cyrus conquered Babylon in 539. So this would have been 539, 538. Sometime in that first year. Okay? In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia, to make a proclamation throughout his realm and to put it in writing. This is what Cyrus, king of Persia, says. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem in Judah. Any one of his people among you, may the Lord his God be with him, and uh, any, any one of his, uh, sorry, any one of his people among you, may the Lord his God be with him, and let him go up. In other words, and Zerubbabel was named governor of Jerusalem and Judah, and given not only permission, but authority and supplies, now not, again, not the gold and silver and jewels that David had collected, but wood and stone and whatever, whatever else he needed to go back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. Now, that was the first thing that happened under Zerubbabel. And they sort of wore down because there was opposition and political opposition and people attacking and all kinds of stuff. And they slowed down and stopped doing it. And so, you read in the Minor Prophets, they came along and started kicking some backside, saying, you guys need to get back on the job, because they had stopped working on the temple. They started working again, and then Ezra comes along with a group of, of additional uh, refugees, returnees. He starts preaching the law, he starts dealing with issues like intermarriage to other people. Again, they had gotten there, and things hadn't turned around immediately, and it was, there was opposition. They had stopped being very attentive to the reason they had gone back to Jerusalem. The prophets got them started again. Ezra encouraged them. Ezra forced them to deal with some of the problems in terms of how they were acting. And then we get to the book of, what we know as the book of Nehemiah, which was all one book. Ezra and Nehemiah was all one book originally. Nehemiah, his brother and some other people come back from Jerusalem to report, and Nehemiah is a, an assistant to the uh, king of Persia. Actually, cupbearer, if I remember right. And so he has access to it. Because a cupbearer is somebody you had to trust because being poisoned was one of the real dangers when you were king back then. So you, you better trust the person who's making sure your, your wine is not being poisoned. So he was the cupbearer, and when when Nehemiah asked his brother and the other people returning, well, how's it going back there? They went, oh man, it's rough. It is not going well. It's not going well because they've been slow to build the temple, but especially because the walls aren't there anymore. The walls of the city have been torn down. And so all these bandits and people who don't want the temple to be built keep coming in and raiding them and taking their stuff and burning their fields and doing all kinds of stuff. It's a mess. Well, Nehemiah is really troubled by this, so much so that the king asks him, said, you know, I don't remember when you seemed so down about stuff. What's wrong with you? And Nehemiah tells him, I got this report. And the king of Persia says, well, what do you want to do about it? And he says, I think I should go back there and oversee the rebuilding of the walls. And the king says, go. How long will it take? And he and his wife, it says, he, the king and queen say, how long will it take? And he gives them a report, and they send him on his way with official documents giving him authority to rebuild the city of Jerusalem, the walls of the city of Jerusalem. And so he does that. And that's... What we're going to pick up on next week, I'm getting a little ahead of myself because that's Ezra and Nehemiah. Okay. Um, any questions about any of that? During, uh, well, oh, tell you, go ahead. The, during, the, during the reconstruction period, the prophets that were prophesying to encourage them there was Haggai. Haggai. Uh, Nahum, Micah? Was Micah there? Micah, Nahum, Haggai. Two of those three. Okay. I'll tell you next week. Because <laughs> we'll get into Ezra and Nehemiah. They, they had a real important Oh, they did. Role. They, they, they were a strong prophetic voice saying, you people have fallen asleep at the wheel. You didn't come back here in order to you know, sit back in your recliner, drink beer, and watch Monday Night Football. That's not why you're here. you got a job to do. Get back to it. This is the Persian Empire. You'll notice. Much of the same areas, Israel here, and, and they actually control this area, but like I said before, this is the Arabian Desert, and who really cares? <laughs> There's nobody there. The only reason that they might have controlled some of this and why, like, the Babylonian map includes it is that there were some trade routes that crossed the Arabian Desert, and there, were, there was a circuit. The Nabataeans built a whole uh, circuit of, um, what's the word I'm looking for, where they had water. 
oases, oases, oases. Where, where they could go from one to the other and actually cross the desert rather than have to go around it, you know, somewhere. And so that was of some interest, the Nabataean oases along the way, the, the, the trade networks. But they controlled all of Egypt, all of Israel and the coastline, all of Asia Minor, all the way over into Incredible. Greece. In fact, the thing that finally happens is that the Greeks are so frustrated with the Persians having run all of this part of the world, as well as everything else, that the Greeks and Macedonians, because Macedonia technically was a different country than Greece, even though they loved it, they were, felt part of Greek culture, that one of the Greeks finally got fed up with it. His name was Philip of Macedon. Yeah, he was Macedonian, not technically not a Greek. Um, and he prepared to conquer. He prepared to cross over and take at least this area, which we, which was known as Asia Minor, what we call Turkey, he was assassinated. His son decided, well, you've got the army ready. You know, dad got the army ready. You know, he was all ready to go, and so I'll do it. And his name was Alexander. Okay. Alexander's primary reason for doing all this was hatred for the Persian Empire, because Persia controlled all of this, even part of this down here. And that, we'll talk about next week. Maybe I'll give you a little bit of Alexander the Great. I've, I've done talks on that. But they control all of the Mesopotamian region, all the way down here into the Persian Gulf. They all the way over into India. This is the Indus River Valley. And that was one of the most ancient cultures in the world. In fact, they just in the last hundred years have discovered that the Indus River Valley may have been the biggest and most sophisticated of ancient civilizations, perhaps as old as the Sumerian civilizations of Mesopotamia. Okay. And they're just still figuring that out. But uh, the Persians went all the way over to India controlling it. So they controlled a huge amount. This is a photograph of Darius the Great. <laughs> I'm sorry, Cyrus the Great. Um, and there are these spectacular, if you go to the British Museum, they actually have you know, some, well, they've got several different cultures, but they've got some huge sculptures and reliefs from the Persian uh, world. Um, and so you, this is a, a, a god. These would have been soldiers, so that you get the picture. These were spears that they're holding. Um, a very, very significant, very powerful, uh, and quite enlightened compared to the other kingdoms of their time, like the fact that they let conquered people go home, all right? And they allowed them to worship freely. They could worship the gods they wanted, whereas the Babylonians, and certainly not the Assyrians, had thought that. There's got to be some pressure on the part of those other countries to have Britain give some of those oh, treasures back. Oh, huge pressure. I mean, you, you wouldn't believe how much pressure. Um, the, the, there are huge diplomatic problems that exist. In fact, Greece, you know, the big sections of the Parthenon and the other uh, temples on top of the Acropolis in Athens, the Greeks just stole them. They're called the Elgin Marbles because Lord Elgin stole them and took them back to, to London. And they've been in the British Museum for 150 years or something. And whenever the, the Greeks tried to get them back, the British would say, oh, you don't even have any place you can put them. <laughs> if you go to Athens now, they have built a state-of-the-art museum, the Museum of the Acropolis, which is all climate controlled. In fact, it's, it's, it's quite astonishing. I, to me, if you've seen the Acropolis two or three times, that's just about it. You know, there's some wonderful other museums I've discovered in Athens, the, the Museum of Archaeology and the Byzantine Museum. But the Acropolis itself, you go into the Acropolis Museum and you're walking up after the entry area, you're walking up this huge wide ramp, and the, the floor is glass. And you look down and you can see three stories down at each level, they've got more stuff. And it's all, it's huge, it's beautiful, it's modern, it's climate controlled. And the Greeks are now saying, give us back our stuff. You can't say anymore, we don't have any place to put it. So give it back. And the British, you know, the countries all over the world are claiming, you, you know, you British, you thought you were the only real civilized people in the world who stole all of our antiquities and things and have taken them back to London. It's time to give them back. And so far they've had very limited success with that. <laughs> so where, where is all that? The British Museum. Yeah. yeah, the British Museum Society most of it. And they have some... Like, they, you walk in there and they've got these Assyrian uh, chimeras, you know, the body of a lion and the head of a, you know, all, all that stuff. Sculptures that are 18 feet tall, you know, huge things. Um, all of which belong to somebody else, but the British won't give it back. So, uh, any questions about any of that? So now you understand why all of that stuff is in Chronicles, you know, why they have all the genealogies and everything.
Yes, yes ma'am. Do, uh, do the Jewish use the Chronicles to help them, I mean, especially back then, make sure that they didn't um, interfere with their own history? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Well, yeah, I mean, the Jews regularly violated that, and that's not an issue for most. Most Jews today are completely secular, and so they don't follow any of those rules. Some of you have Jews in your family, yes. okay? And if they technically were following the rules, they would not have married into Gentile families. But, uh, so they don't follow a lot of that, but at various times they've fallen away and then been called back to it, and fallen away and been called back to it, kind of thing. Uh, it's also worth noting, Jesus at one point says, is talking about God's actions through history, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah who died between the temple and the altar. What's that all about? Second Chronicles, toward the end of Second Chronicles, it talks about the death of Zechariah. Okay. Um, and Chronicles, the book of Chronicles, one book then, was it, is, is at the very end, it's the last book in the Hebrew Bible. And people wonder, well, you know, for our, in our case, it's much earlier than that. It, you know, it comes before Ezra and Nehemiah. Well, it comes after Ezra and Nehemiah, at the very end of the Hebrew Bible. And Jesus, when he said from the blood of Abel, which is first part of Genesis, early Genesis, to the blood of Zechariah who died between the altar and the temple, that's at the end of the book of Chronicles. He's saying throughout the whole history of God's people in the, old, in the Hebrew Bible, from Genesis to Chronicles at the end. Um, and the fact that it's at, chronic, at the end of Chronicles, or Chronicles is at the end of the Hebrew Bible, um, there are various ideas about why that might be, but the strongest thought is it was written latest, because if it really was written in the late 300s, or early 300s rather, then it was written later than Malachi, which was written in the 400s, which is at the end of our Bible. Mm -hmm. So it may very well have been the last of the Old Testament books written, and it ends with the declaration of the Edict of Cyrus freeing the Jews to return home. In other words, that means the Hebrew Bible ends on a positive note. That is a, is a, a promise of a, a potential for the future. Not a guarantee, because there's still the issue of obedience, but there's a very clear message that even in the worst of times, during exile and deportation and everything else, God is still active and things can still happen. Okay? Any other questions? Well, my new Fitbit says it's 2.59, so I'm giving you a minute extra. <laughs> <laughs>